many keys are on a piano? 88. That's how many constellations there are. Oh, wow, cool. Yeah, so there's the 12 of the Zodiac. Right. And the first three letters of the word Zodiac spell what? Zoo. Zoo. So zoo, it's, it's a panoply of animals, creatures, uh, people, this sort of thing. What I like is that the sky has constellations that are of things that are not even real, right? There's like Sagittarius is like is a centaur, right? And you know Sagittarius is half man, half, half horse. horse. We do have other ones where humans are the rear end and the animal is the front end, but they're not a constellation like the Minotaur. The Minotaur, yeah, yeah, that's a the bullhead, the, the bullhead, human body, and a human buttocks, right? Right. Some are mythical, magical creatures. We have a flying horse, which is what. Pegasus. Pegasus is up there. And so it's fun to just see where and when these constellations started and what legends, what cultures, what mythologies put them on the sky. And it's not the same around the world. Okay, if you go to Australia, the Aborigines who've been in Australia longer than anybody else has been anywhere practically, they have their own legends. And their own things they say is up there in the sky. Like there's the constellation Didgeridoo. <laughs> that famous aboriginal constellation. <laughs> and that other constellation, Boomerang. <laughs> no, boomerang Major, Boomerang Minor. Minor. <laughs> got the big go. and the little boomerang. Right. So the thing is, the constellations tend to emanate from people's cultures. What's especially interesting in Australia is that the Milky Way, which is in full view most of the year at night, there are parts of the Milky Way that are dark. And astrophysically, we thought there, that was the absence of stars. So we thought that these were gaps in where the stars were in the Milky Way. We would later learn that they're simply dark gas clouds obscuring the view behind it. So we in the West tend to give meaning to where we see light, whereas in Australia, they saw those dark areas and they gave meaning to the dark areas. So in fact, one of the more famous of the dark constellations, if we may call it that, is what's called dark emu. Emu is, is you know, one of the creatures unique to, right. uh, to, to Australia. It's, it's also a, uh, a very popular insurance salesperson here in America. Emu. Oh, emu. yes, it is. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I forgot that was an yeah. emu. Anyhow, so depending on where you are in the world, they have different constellations and different cultures and the like. That's, I just want to make put that up, up front. What we know in the West is what the West has written about constellations. And that's what I'll spend most of this, the, the rest of the few minutes on. So what do we have? Uh, we have sleepless, possibly drug-induced <laughs> Greeks and Romans... <laughs> and Babylonians looking up into the night sky, right. okay? Right. I don't know what they were smoking. I don't know. Right. But to see four stars in the night sky, there's like a triangle and then another star that's above it, to look at that and say, yes, I see a crab with two claws. That takes extreme imagination. Mm -hmm. Or drugs. Right. <laughs> you know? Back then they called it pharmakia. That's what the Greeks called it. Because they were getting high. So that that's just an, an example of what the foundation was for people then dreaming this stuff up. Right. And so most of the constellations that we see in the Northern Hemisphere were seen by the Greeks and the Romans and, and earlier before them, the Babylonians. And, and so they thought about it and they put up their legends. Okay? So we have... Perseus and Andromeda and Pegasus and there's even Medusa not a constellation but Medusa's bloody severed head is being held by Perseus in the sky after it has been cut off why, why did he cut off Medusa's head to uh, to turn the Kraken into stone yes to turn the, so that he could save uh, what's her face <laughs> yes <laughs> To save what's her face? To save what's her face? <laughs> Pegasus was made from sea foam, and it's a flying horse, not anatomically correct flying horse, because in the real world, you any mammal that flies, it forfeits its front limbs to be wings to do so. That makes sense. And bats, of course, gave that up. So that's just how that goes. Wow. So Pegasus in the sky is not anatomically correct. That's all I'm saying. Right. Okay. However. Are we really not going to suspend disbelief for a flying horse? <laughs> no. 
Correct. So I'm not going to blame anybody for giving Pegasus four legs plus wings. All right. They want them that way. Fine. I would say there's five out of the 88 that look like what they're supposed to look like. And I'll give this my top list here. So Orion the Hunter, good to go. Maybe I'll give you Hercules, but Orion is a way better strong man in the sky than is Hercules. Uh, Leo, there's some stars that look like the... The, the, the main the main and the head and a body that comes backwards i'll give you leo okay. so what are we up to three okay All right. Two i got more. one for you you ready go ahead um <laughs> there's a constellation called triangulum okay guess how many stars it has it better have three <laughs> it's three stars <laughs> it is a most excellent representation of what it's supposed to be that's pretty okay. awesome now how did a triangle slip in with all these mythical magical creatures it's because the greeks couldn't see the southern hemisphere sky and it wasn't until the 1700s where abby louis nicholas lacai i think i have most of his names right he was a peripatetic i think it was a monk actually but he went to the southern hemisphere with the purpose sole intent of mapping the rest of the sky oh wow look at that yeah i know i know so he so for the for the folks in the west because of course in australia they've been there done that millennia earlier and he's this is like late 1700s or so this is the dawn of the industrial revolution and he says to myself these other things are important to me not the greek and roman gods so he lays it out and he names a sextant. Oh God. That is that, a that, that is a constellation called sextants. Yeah. It, it's a yes. It's, an octant. Right. Okay. Which preceded the sextant. Two navigational devices are down there. Right. He has Argo Navis, which is the the ship for uh, I think it was Jason and the Argonauts. Okay. okay. But so that's legend, of course. But he has but parts of the ship. He has a keel. A mast, a compass. This is a navigational compass. All of these are constellations. There is the two-star constellation, Telescopium. Okay. <laughs> We're stretching, buddy. <laughs> uh, two, uh, point A, point A. Yeah, it's a telescope. <laughs> what are you going to do? <laughs> There's also a drafting table. Okay. It's, yeah, it's called Picter, I think it is. It's, it's, it's someone at a drafting table. So the constellations are very different depending on what era people absorbed them, named them, and put them in the books. What's, in your mind, the most famous constellation in the Southern Hemisphere? Oh, in the Southern? God. See, so what I was going to say, but that's not Southern, was Big Dipper, but everybody knows that. Yeah, that's the North. Yeah. That's the yeah. North. Okay, yeah, in you're the Southern Hemisphere. 8,000 miles off. I know. Um, <laughs> I said it was in the north. No, nine um, out of ten people say the Southern Cross. I was about to say the cross. You yeah. do, you were not. I no really was. Of that. No, let me tell you something. I really was about to say the cross, but I was scared to do so because one night we were sitting out and you had your, you know, top secret uh, sky pointer government issue, <laughs> and you were and you. But there's a cross in the north too. Yeah. That you would, and so that's why I would. I was about to say cross but okay so there's a northern confused. cross which we love here in the northern hemisphere and there's a southern cross but they're really different from each other okay the southern cross is embarrassing compared to the northern cross oh no okay the oh, southern funny. cross has four stars in it okay it's in the shape of a rhombus uh, there is no star there's, there's no there's at no the cross. transept right yeah so you could have just drawn a rhombus to remind people from eighth grade geometry. A rhombus is like, take a perfect square, sit on it, distort the sides, and then you get a rhombus, okay? So it is a stretch to call the Southern Cross a cross. It's a stretch. I'm just telling you. Wow. Not only that, of all 88 constellations, the Southern Cross is the smallest. Oh. Your thumbnail at arm's reach would completely cover all four stars of the Southern Cross. Oh. It is one of the biggest marketing delusions there ever was. And isn't I mean, there a Crosby Stills uh, song? Crosby, Nat, um, Crosby Stills the Southern Nash? Cross. Oh, okay. uh, that's the only line I know of it because it has uh, okay, astronomical. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't know this song at all, but. <laughs> well, they didn't sing that in the hood. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, CSR, that's, uh, you know, 
It's a little <laughs> Caucasian for me. I'm just saying. <laughs> I mean, don't so, get me wrong, but I, you know. So this, I just want to put put it out there with the Southern Cross. Now, have you ever met people who have visited the Southern Hemisphere anywhere, be it Africa or Australia? Right. And and they come back and what do they tell you about the sky? Uh, I, you know, I never really got into it. Never got into it. I normally ask him about the place they okay. were. See, that's, that's how's how the clubs? Do, how's that? Yeah, exactly. You know, tell me about the food. What did you see? You know, okay. only you would be like, and so the night sky. Yeah, tell I'm sorry. Me, I'm tell a little me more about here. that night sky. <laughs> what happens is people visit the Southern Hemisphere and they come back and they say, the Southern Hemisphere, hemisphere sky is so beautiful. Yeah. It is so amazing. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And... And so there's another little delusion going on there as well. And what is that? I don't want to stop you from liking the Southern Hemisphere sky better than the North. I, I have no problems with that. But there are forces operating that contaminate your data. Okay? Okay. Do you know how much of Earth's land is in the Southern Hemisphere? Um, I would say not a lot. Not a lot. About I mean, when you look at Africa, it's like, that's most of it. Yes, okay. <laughs> About 15% of Earth's land mass is south of the equator. Okay. Yeah. That's also about 15% of Earth's population. Oh. Okay? So hardly anybody lives in the Southern Hemisphere. Right. So there's hardly any city lights Hardly any light pollution, air pollution, all the things that subtract away from our experience embracing the sky in the north does not block your view in the south. So people think the actual sky is better because they can see it better. Wow. So I'm telling you that the north has all the coolest constellations. All right, you know, with the Big Dipper and the, you know, and the Little Dipper and the, you know, and or, and 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 Cassiopeia. Some constellations straddle the North and the South. Orion is half in the North and half in the South. But when we look at him, he's right side up. If you want to see Orion in the Southern Hemisphere, he's upside down. That there's that's, there's no excuse for that. So I'm just, I'm a northern chauvinist here, but I think I have good reason for it. Daniel Kulikowski was asking um, about your views on the current state of light pollution around the world and if there's any negative impacts on people's feelings and perceptions about the night sky. Good. what do you have in it? So, yeah, with light pollution, um, I'm going to start there. I'm going to say, yes, I am very concerned about light pollution. I've done a lot of work with the International Dark Sky Association. And the idea is that, um, from an indigenous uh, practice and way of life, uh, the, the sky and our connection with the sky, um, it's an essential. It's not an option. It's not an accessory. It's uh, the place where we come from. The stars are not just physical, distant, abstract balls of plasma or gas. Those are our relatives, our oldest living relatives. And, you know, we even have in Lakota, there's teachings that the, the stars are the breath of the spirits, you know, so it's not, it's about like a, a family reunion. It's blocking that level of connection. And every distraction that exists in modern living that distracts us in the evening, isn't that tantamount to light pollution? You know, it's because we have HBO and Disney Plus and, and Netflix right. and all of these things. I come home. And I, my first thought is, let me binge something, or let me watch a movie, or let me watch Nagin uh, doing a stand-up, <laughs> not a sit-down, a stand-up. Aren't, aren't you also competing with all the rest of these cultural forces? Yes, absolutely. We, we are very distracted. We have very short attention spans. We're looking for the next fun thing. But the, there's something really important and fundamental about our connection to the stars. Um, and that there should be a place for that. There should be a kind of protection for that. I know that with the International Dark Sky Association, there we've you know created this uh, protection protected areas because we talk about the extinction, like the night sky is going extinct. And so you know here in Minnesota, it's a luxury because we can drive you know five ten minutes and really see dark skies. We can really see. Uh, the Andromeda galaxy. We could really see the Northern Lights, right? I mean, you're in New York City. Wow, I really feel bad for you. <laughs> you, have, you, have the you have the planetarium, right? 
Yeah, we just we but just we just we just uh, huddle we don't together have stars. in the planetarium <laughs> dome and put up the fake aurora and the fake. Uh, that's what we'll, we'll do. Don't there. forget to let a few just... mosquitoes inside there to make it real, <laughs> buzzing around, Can... make you feel at home. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Can I just say, in defense of myself, though, that my stand-up is not the enemy of the cosmos. If anything, it's Squid Game. So oh, let's just, like, you know, okay. no, note where popular culture is right now. Go on. Just blame something else instead of yourself. Okay, fine. But, you know, Annette, I actually I grew up in the desert of Southern California in a town called Palm Springs. And they have very strict light pollution laws. So I live in New York City now where, in my estimation, we don't have stars um but in palm springs we have a ton of stars i grew up with uh, seeing a lot of stars be- stars because they were very serious about light pollution and with your astigmatism the sky very clear they were estima- with my astigmatism stars. and i'd often see them d- there's <laughs> there's two there's two of everything if you look at it through my, my through my eyes jay hunt asks, I was wondering how indigenous tribes, constellations, identification, and sky tracking has changed over the centuries. What are some of the more famous constellations that have made it into the modern lexicon? Oh, interesting. So the changes over the ages, I think one of the biggest things to say about that is the idea of um, loss. Um, We've lost a lot of our star knowledge and our cultural knowledge and our languages because of colonization. In the star maps that we created, you know, working with elders and other primary sources, there's a lot of like blank spaces. And um, my Inanu elder, Wilford Buck, um, he talks about the idea that, um, you know, before colonization, that map would have been filled up just like what we think of now as the Greek map. It would have been dense, you know, every single star and even the dimmer stars, there's constellations. But now we look at our constellations and there's there's some spaces and that's part of that loss. So I think the and first that you're thing about- out here. The farthest object visible to the unaided eye is a galaxy beyond the stars of the constellation Andromeda. So you find Andromeda in the sky and there's stars there and then there's like a fuzzy patch Right. Okay. The stars you see are just sitting on our nose in our own galaxy, the Milky Way. The fuzzy patch is well beyond this, two million light years away. Wow. Okay. You can see it because there's so many stars there. And the light is, but you can't resolve it, so it's just a puddle of light. In fact, it wasn't until 1920, no, 1926, that Edwin Hubble, the man, not the telescope, put his telescope on this fuzzy patch and resolved it into stars. Wow. Okay? So before then, people just called it a nebula. It was like the Andromeda Nebula. They thought it was just a fuzzy cloud. So that this is why what things look like to you aren't always what they are. All right? So he does this, and you realize it's an entire other galaxy. That galaxy is visible to the naked eye. So that galaxy has 200, 400 billion stars in it. Right. So if you want to if you want to think differently about what the human eye can see, you take your 3000 that are in our galaxy up there and then add to it the hundreds of billions in the Andromeda galaxy which you can also see. Wow, look at that. And in that case when you look up, if you include the Andromeda galaxy in your field of view, you get to say You're seeing billions bi- of stars bi- again. Billions and billions. Will the sky look different if we are all standing on another planet? constellations and such. So if I'm if I'm on another planet in this solar system, mm-hmm. do I see the same sky? Yes. What? You That's, heard what I said? You said yes. Are you what well, yeah. So here's it's a simple answer, okay? So the extent of our solar system is like from like the sun to Neptune. Mhm. Get over it. Okay. <laughs> no, if, if yeah. you look at the planets, so so it's this. So basically, we're such a small little exactly, part. Exactly. Exactly. We so, are not going to change the frame of reference. Exactly. So if you look at the width of the solar system, it's like ten light hours across. Okay. It would take a beam of light ten hours to cross the solar system. That's big. That's a long time, especially right. going at the speed of light. Right. However, as you look at the nearest stars, the stars that comprise the constellations, they are hundreds of light years away. Gotcha. So if you just shift your head 10 light hours, who, you know, the stars yeah, don't mean nothing. Right. They don't mean a damn thing to the stars. That's so you got to start moving among the stars to change your 
perspective on the constellations for them to take on other shapes. Nice. And, and drag all the astrologers with you as they right. try to keep up with the new shapes. Right, okay? exactly. And tell you how the universe will now affect you right. because of the random stars oriented in the galaxy. That one looks like someone looking at a cloud. What will we call it? That's a <laughs> 